Thank received you. a generation. Before that, a new series could help you uncover your blood ties. Across Britain, genealogy is booming. Last year, nearly half a million people came here to the Family Records Centre in London. I warn you, it's a highly addictive business. The people peering at census entries here have embarked on a kind of personal journey. None of them know what they might find. Heroes, villains, long-lost relatives, the truth about a family myth. In Blood Ties, we'll be telling some of the surprising stories that family history uncovers and helping you research your ancestors. We start with a Labour politician who had a secret life. This is a story of the River Thames of a hundred years ago and a man who led a strike that brought the London docks to a standstill. It all began with a letter from Hampshire. Dear Sirs, my maiden name used to be Tillett and I've always been intrigued by a character my mother said was related to us. His name was Ben Tillett. He became a seaman and then a docker in the port of London. Ben Tillett went on to become famed as the man who led the great London dock strike of 1889. Ben Tillett not only led that strike, he went on to become one of the founders of the Independent Labour Party and a Labour MP for eight years. Using the efforts of other people that work in sport, Shirley Tad went to see genealogist Steve Thomas to try to find a link between her father Albert Charles Tillett and the famous Ben Tillett. I've got a few links, hopefully, with my father's past. Do you have your father's death certificate? Yes. I've brought That's that good. along as well. So that'll be our starting point. Is it? Yes. Right. So having established where we're going to start the, the research from, now perhaps you can tell me more about the other things you have here. This is his seaman's logbook. Mm -hmm. He lived in the east end of London yes. and he worked in the docks and he worked on the ships. The Port of London connection is a good start, but no proof that the two Tillets are related. As Steve and Shirley began their research, I went to the docks to find out more about Ben Tillett's life as a union leader. We're part of the Museum of London. The Museum of London's job is to chart the story of London as a port, as a city. And of course, without the Port of London, there wouldn't be a city. So in all these rather boring looking cardboard boxes, there must be a wealth of, of absolutely, material. Absolutely. These are property leases going back to the 1600s. Which show there are also the workers' lists, staff books, and a wonderful photographic archive. By 1882, Ben Tillett was a full-time docker at a tea wharf on the Thames. It must have been an amazing place to live and work, really. I mean, the, it, it had a stereotypical name for poverty. There were 900,000 people living in the East End of London. A third of those were living below the poverty line. And for somebody like Ben Tillett, a dock labourer, mm. what was their working day like? A very hard, intensely physical labour. There was work in the docks for perhaps four or five thousand men every day. But in peak days, there would be work for 30,000. So those people would come to the docks hoping to be taken on. You've got a, a pretty vivid description here of the men pouring in through the dock gates. You've got the chain here slung across and of course you've got the police watching what's going on. I mean these were scenes of great violence. The men fought with each other to be taken on for work. This photo here is called eager for work. In fact they weren't eager, they were bloody desperate for work. By 1887 Ben Tillett was secretary of the Tea Operatives and General Labourers Association. Two years later he rallied some hundred thousand men in what became the great dock strike of 1889 it paralysed the busiest port in the world and lasted for over a month. It was round here that crowds of dock workers used to gather to hear Ben Tillett fire them up for the strike. Unlike modern speakers, Ben had no microphone, no autocue, no spin doctors. 
and Devin Self was a rather unlikely orator. He was only five foot four, self-educated. He even had a stammer. Yet he managed to rally the Dockers to a cause that would change Labour history forever. His legacy, undoubtedly, is mass unionism for the ordinary casual worker. He founded the uh, Dock Labourers Union in the 1880s, and that eventually became the Transport and General Workers Union, the biggest union in the world at one time. We're back to the in their search for a connection with Ben Tillett, Shirley Tad and Steve Thomas have discovered some evidence of a possible link. The yes. connection may be that of yes. brother, cousin, uncle or yes. nephew. Yes, yes. So and it needs to go back another generation or possibly two. It's not going to, you're not going to have a descent to... from Benjamin. You're going to no, have... No, it's going to be a brother or a... He would be related to him, yes. possibly at right. an earlier period. Yeah. So Shirley and Ben Tillett aren't directly related, though they may have shared some ancestors much earlier in the 19th century. But what about Ben Tillett's direct line? We decided to track down any living descendants. Ben Tillett married Jane Tompkins when he was a young docker. They had nine children, but only two girls survived into adulthood. The next generation were all boys, and four of those grandsons are still alive today. They have fond memories of their grandfather. People in all kinds of all walks of life thought a great deal of him. I look forward to seeing him because I usually got half a crown you know, at the end of the day. <laughs> Me too. Yes. Yeah. My mother and, and my grandfather were very close. They, he, she was very fond of him. He took her down the docks and she saw dock workers working on planks and falling in the dock. And she, he said to her, you know, this is what we've got to contend with. I can see him now sitting in our front room, expounding about some probably political thing. And it was like, it was magnetic, you know, you, you, you couldn't keep your eyes or your being off him. The grandsons and their family albums recall Tillett as a prominent public figure throughout the 20s and 30s. Tillett obviously enjoyed his fame. He regularly mixed with actors, celebrities, even the Prince of Wales. But then our research uncovered a whole other side to the Ben Tillett story. We were told that Warwick University had a collection of papers passed on by Tillett's granddaughter. But we knew from the family tree there were only grandsons. At Warwick, I met the alleged granddaughter, Claire Taylor. Well, um, I first came here a couple of years ago because I'd given some papers I inherited from my aunt. And uh, in her will, she'd stipulated that the uh, papers um, that pertain to her father, who was Ben Tillett, were, would be given to the TUC. Throughout her life, Claire Taylor has understood that her father was the illegitimate son of Ben Tillett. Okay, well show me how you're related then on this family tree we've got to, to Ben Tillett. Well, this, you know, this is the respectable side and this is the, the other side. Uh, and this is, this is me here at the bottom. Uh, this is my father. My father was the eldest of the children that uh, he had with Eva Margaret Newton. Claire's story is that Ben Tillett met Eva Newton, an Australian opera singer, while on a union trip to Sydney. She came back to England with him, and although Ben was still married, he shared a house with Eva in Bethnal Green. They had four illegitimate children, Eva, Beaumont, Olga, and Claire's father, Ben. Claire has two birth certificates for her father. They show he was born in 1899 and was called Ben Newton but the father's name is missing. So there's no mention of Ben Tillett on no. these birth certificates. No. How do you know that there really is a family connection? Well, it's one of those stories that you grow up with as a child. And um, I knew that they were illegitimate. I knew that their father was quite kind of well-to-do in his time. But when I was young, I'd never heard of him or anything else. And this is actually a photograph of them together. Here's the little chap down here. And she was a rather large lady of five foot ten, so they must have looked rather incongruous couple. And when I was a child, we had lots of these photographs where he's the guy at the end. There's lots of books and things so, here. So these are signed. This is one, Dad Ben here. Dad Ben, so that's yes, 1931. Yeah. Um, I've seen other evidence of his handwriting. It's definitely his handwriting. Claire's story is pretty persuasive. These are the kind of personal papers that only a family member would have. Well, perhaps one of the biggest things 
is in the papers that I did hand over, there was actually this passport with Mr. B. Tillett on. Heavily used passport because he traveled, traveled all over the place. Yes. yes, as we know, nice photograph of him, looking very thoughtful. Same signature again. And here we've got Eva Lewis Tillett, 14 years female. Calling what Claire Taylor has is perhaps what a lot of people lack. She has documentation. She has that body of evidence built up by the fact that she was a member and part of that family. And after all, it was she that had sufficient of this material to hand over to an archive. So to me, it would appear that she was a member of that family. So the story of Ben Tillett, leader of the great dock strike, now has a new and rather more human side. The socialist pioneer was also the lover of an Australian opera singer and the father of four illegitimate children. We decided to introduce the various members of the Tillett clan and to reveal their previously unknown connections. Right, well, you're all here because, as you know, you've all got a connection with Ben Tillett and all, I must say, a great enthusiasm for Ben Tillett, which has been really nice for us to find out a bit more about. Now, the whole reason for us being here all starts off, this is Shirley Tad, and Shirley thought, your, your, your mother always told you that you had some sort of connection, didn't she, yes, with, with yes. Ben Tillett? But I think most interesting of all is William Tillett, who's your great-great-grandfather. Now, he was born in Bristol yes. and then moved to Bethnal Green in oh, London. Yeah. Now, that sort of rings a bell, doesn't mm, it? Yeah. Because that's what Ben Tillett did. Yeah. Ben yes. Tillett came from Bristol. Bristol. To... So, after all, Shirley Tad probably is a distant relative of Ben Tillett. <laughs> so, there you are. There's, there's your... That's the start on your, on your Tillett family tree. Oh, that's absolutely wonderful. Wow. Oh, that means I'm going to follow it out further now. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> more, oh, dear. more research oh, needs to be done. And in fact, so the next stage of our journeys, we went to um, the Modern Records Centre in Coventry. And the Ben Tillett material had come from a granddaughter. And we thought, well, this is very odd. We don't know about a granddaughter. We knew about the sort of grandsons. And we said, well, could you put us in touch with, with, with a granddaughter? And they did. And this is Claire Taylor. Oh, I see. <laughs> so, Claire, perhaps you'd like to explain what, what your connection is. Um, I'm afraid my father was a result of a, a, a liaison, a, well, a, a large liaison that Ben Tillett had with this, this Australian lady that he met oh, in Australia yes. in 1898. Oh, this is news to us. <laughs> oh, and, um, I'm afraid it does a bit. We're, we're acquiring an enormous extended family now. Um, <laughs> and so there's a lot of. Australian relatives that I part of my job is to go and sort of track them down. Oh, that's very good. But this idea probably doesn't come as a total shock. No, I always heard, I always understood that there was a, an illegitimate son somewhere that he had that he used to make some had some atten interest in. That's what I was told. Yes, I think but he did. And it wasn't it was just all very vague. And it wasn't just um, one son, was it? It was a it was a whole family. There you have Eva, Ben, Beaumont, and Olga. Yes. <coughs> I'm sorry, there were four of them. <laughs> Come as a complete surprise. It's not a shock, I'm just surprised. Well, you're surprised that, that it happened, yeah. yeah. That you're, you don't think it's in any way out of character, do you? Oh, no, no. Human nature being what it is and so forth. No. And knowing how... If family like history is about anything, everyone. it's about the unexpected. Since we made that film, the various branches of the Tillett family have had a reunion to compare memorabilia and to piece together that secret life of their ancestor. We'll let you know if anything else emerges. Now, with the volumes at the Family Record Centre, it's red for births, green for marriage, and black, of course, for death. I've been looking at exactly what you can learn from a death certificate. They started with general registration in 1837, and on all of them, you'll find the name of the deceased, the cause of death, and the informant. That's the person who reported the death. The informant may well be a relative of the deceased, so that may give you another name for your family tree. Cause of death is useful too. If it was accidental, or worse, there may be coroner's records or even newspaper reports to look at. And death certificates since 1968 have the date of birth, which is very useful because that leads you straight back to a birth certificate.
you can order death certificates from the Family Record Centre. They're £6.50 or £22.50 if you want them in 24 hours. More details on our website. But remember, you don't often need the actual certificate at all. The index of births, marriages and deaths will have much of the information you're after. That's at the Family Record Centre too. And they can also advise you of any copies in your area. For deaths before 1837, there are no certificates at all. So then you have to look for records of burial. More about that in a couple of weeks. I found my great-grandfather in the death index. It's interesting enough just to see this. So imagine what it must be like to find a tin chest stuffed with documents, some dating back as far as the 16th century. Well, that's what happened to John Solkeld. And it gave him far more than the bare bones of a family tree. Well, we didn't know it existed until my grandmother died and we were going through her effects with my father. And uh, it was, as I say, it's just like a treasure trove when, uh, when we found it, for, for me especially as a history teacher, with documents mixed up with letters that go back centuries. This is the pick of, I suppose, visually the pick of the documents. It's, a gay, it's some sort of uh, legal document involving sale of land. Wow. But it's, it's just the way that it's decorated. It's on, on yeah, parchment, it's I think. Beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. The documents date back 14 generations, from John, a schoolteacher in Kent, to landed gentry in Dorset. In the coming weeks, we'll be following his investigations of those ancestors. He started by going to York Minster to see an archivist who specialises in translating from Latin and so-called secretarial hand. This is the oldest document from my grandmother's tin chest. Which, oh, lovely, uh, an inventory. Yeah. Well, this is, this is super. I love inventories because they are a sort of 16th and 17th century version through the keyhole. You get the opportunity to snoop around other people's yeah. houses. Um, so this begins the inventory of all and singular, the goods and chattels of Nicholas Meggs. 700 ewes. Gosh. 700 ewes? Yes. Valued. Can I write these down? <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> 24 pounds the hundred. So he's got seven... John's ancestor, Nicholas Meggs, had got his wealth by marrying Jane Peverell of Bradford Peverell in Dorset. The inventory lists all his possessions at the time of his death in 1579. Right, yeah. hundred and a half of hogs, uh, valued at 20 pounds the hundred. Uh, as well as livestock and land, the inventory lists tablecloths, um, blankets, even brewing pots. Uh, well, the total of his inventory uh, comes to 351 pounds. A great deal of money. I mean, in 1579, that's, that's, that's big sums. That's very big sums. So, 81 pounds. So, John's 16th century ancestors, the Meggs, were substantial landowners. And papers from another branch of the family reveal the origins of further wealth. This, this one's Cromwellian, I think. Um, I think it's got 1651 or something like that. What exactly is this document? I've never really known what it is. This document is the legal record, which is called a recovery, uh, which is the final stage in the legal transaction of property from one person to another. The recovery was the, the document which allowed the person who was really buying the land to have legal title. Mm. Louise was able to help John work out who was buying the land by deciphering the names on the documents. Uh, do demand against James Dewey, Esquire, I've never heard of any of those, <laughs> I don't know how she's got it. And Trevor Pauls. Whoever Trevor he, Paul? Trevor Paul. Tremor, could it be Tremor? Tremor, yes, it could be. Could be. That, ah, that's it. There's another document. That, which ah, maybe this right. is cue to lead into uh, to this one, which is a few years later. The, and I, I th I, I'm quite proud of the fact that I think I can read this more or less, because it's, um, it's a pre-marriage contract. Uh, I think. Articles of Covenants agreement that forms part of the marriage portion. It is indeed a 17th century pre-nuptial agreement for the marriage of Tremor Paul's daughter in 1666. Six gardens, 22 acres of land. Um, mm. If we just have yeah. a look here and see exactly no, what's being handed over as the marriage portion. Wow, he's giving them 300 pounds of good and lawful English money within really? four months after oh, the present yeah. day. That's a lot. Um, that's, a, that's an enormous amount of money it? Yes. in the 1660s. <laughs> mm. So the two papers are connected. 
the land in the recovery document of 1651 becomes a dowry 14 years later in the marriage contract, adding to the wealth of John's forebears. But this, I mean, so they're pretty prosperous. They're getting a house on £300, yeah. pounds, so yeah. you're talking a wealthy middle That's, class. Yes, you had a and the decorated manuscript also turns out to be related to the same marriage and the land that went with it. Oh, wow, it's so lovely, isn't it? Do you know what it is? Or um, can you tell what it is? It's a letters patent. There are two main types of, of royal correspondence, really, um, between the, the king and a named subject. Letters patent are open letters. They're meant to be seen. This may well be uh, the royal assent to that transfer. I think this is what this oh, is. I see. It's the same thing. With the monarchy restored, Charles II's assent was necessary for any transfer of land. Louise has now linked three of John's earliest documents. They paint a classic picture of an English country estate growing by marriage through the generations. It's just knowing about them as individuals and knowing something, finding out more about the way that they lived. And uh, I'm just fascinated by finding that out. In a couple of weeks, we follow John to his family seat in Dorset. Of course, you don't have to have ancestral acres to find out interesting stuff about your forebears. A remarkable collection of photographs in Birmingham is bringing people face to face with their ancestors in a way they never expected. <laughs> Harry Fletcher, 15th of February, 1882. Nine months in prison for stealing 80 yards of cloth from a shop door. James Moss, 14 days and five years at the reform school, stealing a shilling from his master. Gladys Bell, born 1890, larceny from the person. Annie Preston, born in 1889 and sentenced for the theft of a candlestick. Two children stole some fancy cakes from a shop. He sentenced both children to seven strokes of the cane. These mugshots, taken between 1858 and 1920, are kept in the West Midlands Police Museum, a rogues gallery of more than 5,000 people, from petty thieves to hardened criminals. Dave Cross is the curator. I was a serving policeman for about 30 years, and I always had an interest in the Victorian art and Victorian Birmingham. And obviously the police superintendent knew it, and when they wanted the museum set up as an operational resource, I retired, found myself working in here now as a part-time curator and keeper of the museum. We know so little about the true life of the Victorians that here we've got now, we've got the facility to make discoveries, even if it's a discovery about one person and what happened to him. One such discovery was 10-year-old Charles Lamborn, who was jailed and whipped for petty theft. His photo appeared in a recently published collection. I'd been up to the library to do some research along with my mum. And we were sitting on the bus coming home and we bought some local history books because we collect those as well. And I saw him and I thought, I'm sure he's ours. We went back to the St Catherine's House Index, sent for the birth certificate. And lo and behold, he is ours. My great, great uncle. I was ecstatic. I really was. I was so pleased. You can have all the dates and the addresses and everything, but you still can't see them. I don't think he looks like us, but it's so nice to actually see him. And he does look so sorry for himself, doesn't he? Lo and behold, he did it again when he was 16. I don't know yet what he did. That's what I've come here to find out. And again, I don't know what he looked like at 16. And over on this page, Charles Lamborn, age 16. Oh, is that it? That it? Four foot eleven, one month imprisonment for stealing a watch and 18 shillings from his master. And that's on the 10th of May, 1882. Oh, he looks much more grown up. He looks much harder there. He's lost his innocence, hasn't he? What we think was the reason was that he was the oldest mouth to feed. He was eating the most in the house but not earning any money. Mm. So the easiest way, because he'd got no real standard good education, was to have him go to one of the approved schools. But the only way you could do that was to get a criminal conviction. So the parents arrested him, knowing they'd get 14 days in prison 
and then five years at the reform school where they'd be taught a trade and a profession they'd be taught further English and maths and Bible study in the evening mm. I think the best thing about finding photographs like this is that you are absolutely sure who they are I mean people still today don't write on the back of photographs and say this was taken at such and such a time this was the event and this is who it is this has to be authentic doesn't it they know who he was they know exactly when it was taken so how have you got on with your research for many working people these photographs are the only record they have local family historian louise newton was contacted by dave when he discovered her family on file some of her ancestors were called giblin in 1904, Florence Giblin was caught stealing some boots. What do you know about Florence? Florence was born in 1884. She yeah. was five foot three, and she has the same colouring as me. She has brown hair and brown eyes. How are you going to prove that Florence is one of yours from the, from the original roots of your tree? This is quite easy. With civil registrations in place, I can get her birth certificate. It tells you that she was born in 1884, so I'd only have to check on St. Catherine's House Index for the year that she was born in and find a Florrie Giblin. But there wasn't many Giblins in Birmingham at that time, yeah. so she must be one of ours somewhere along the line. And I've actually researched her court record. That was an easy one to find yeah. in Birmingham Library. What happened when she went to court? Well, she was rather a bit of a madam. Yeah. Um, and when yeah. sentenced to nine months hard labour, she shouted to the judge that she, thank you for the tip, climbed over the banister and threw a stall at one of the wardens. They've also found in the records, nearly 30 years earlier, Florence Giblin's uncle. As a 12-year-old, he was sentenced to six weeks. This is a picture of my great-great-great-grandfather, Thomas Giblin. And he's sitting there in 1876 for stealing lead. It just fits in the, the way he looks, the colouring, everything. He's definitely one of our Giblins. How did you feel when there was a, every chance that there's photographs of your relatives? I was totally amazed. This is the only opportunity I would have of having a photograph of my family. My father is so proud. He has that picture enlarged and on his lounge wall. Does he really? Yes. In helping people like Louise, the former police constable spends hours studying the faces of Victorian criminals. They say every family has got a black sheep in the family. Well, obviously, when I came here, I suppose out of curiosity, my surname is Cross, so the first thing I did was had a look to see how many crosses there were. And I opened the book one day, and there was a guy called Anthony Cross. And he was charged with stealing a shirt off a washing line. And he got 14 days imprisonment. I'll just take off my glasses, and then you can have a look at the photograph. I also realised that I was looking at my dad and all his brothers. He looks very much like my father's brothers. Not quite the beard, but... The facial looks, the hairline, the whole expression on the face. So I've done a bit of quick checking up. And that Anthony appears to be my great-grandfather. Now, I'm not sure at this stage whether he's my great-grandfather or his brother. It's there. Somewhere he's related, there's no doubt about it. Next week, the Victorian criminal's ultimate nightmare, the public hangman. I'll be following a surveyor from Bogner as he reveals the macabre career of his ancestor. Until then, goodbye. We've put a selection of those mug shots on our website. Let us know if there's one of yours among them. There's also a guide to researching your family history. And you can call the History 2000 information line on 08700 10 60 60 to find out how you can take your interest in history further where you live.